رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وسيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري وأسر لي أمري وأحمد أخرى تبني لساني وفاره طولي اللهم علمنا ما يفعل وفعل من عالم تنا وزيدنا عنده اللهم إلينا الحق حقا وزيدنا اتباع وإلينا الباطل الباطل وزيدنا تشرينا لك بنيمة الله لدى نفس سيدنا مرسفو رأس الله عز وجل to bless this gathering to grant us from his knowledge and mercy we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to enlighten our hearts to make us leave this room, inshaAllah, with uh, you know, increased understanding, uh, elevated faith, and inshaAllah, closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla and His Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Dear brothers, dear sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Jazakallah Khair for coming, and I'm uh, you know, quite grateful to the MSA uh, for inviting me to be with you tonight. Sorry about the delay. This came with Zahar actually from College Park. We just, just finished a uh, halakha with the MSA there. Just running a little bit late. Now I asked before I begin, when is Salat Nine o'clock? So a good uh, hour and a half. You guys will be hanging in here, and <laughs> inshallah for the end. Inshallah? Okay, good. So, a couple of rules, good rules. Inshallah, stop me at any time if you have questions. Don't be shy. I've noticed that some. For some reason, with uh, especially with younger Muslims, when you really ask them to ask questions, everybody's like, mm. I don't know what it is. Perhaps shyness. Um, never be shy to ask questions, brothers and sisters. The companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never shied away from asking questions. The companion women who were around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never shied to ask questions. So we have to overcome this bad habit of being shy be associated with asking questions about certain topics that don't feel appropriate. There is no such thing as inappropriate to ask, no matter what the subject is. Um, and don't, don't feel like, uh, subhanAllah, you, your struggles are everybody's struggles. Nobody's above anybody. And we're not here to judge each other. We're here to learn and grow together. So uh, with that, uh, I begin, inshallah, my subject. And I begin, it, brothers and sisters, with a, with a reminder. And this is a very important thing. You came here to learn. I came here to learn as well. We're here to remember Allah Azza wa first and foremost. But there's something interesting with learning and growing in knowledge. Everybody nowadays talks about knowledge. Actually, younger Muslims, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, they're coming to this realization that SubhanAllah, they, you know, they have this thirst for knowledge and everybody is really seeking it, right? And in the midst of this journey of seeking knowledge, to enhance our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, whatever our motives are, and I pray to Allah that it's always for the sake of Allah. We forget who the first, SubhanAllah, who the first educator is. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who uh, was raised without a father or a mother. There is really a very powerful reason behind this. Many reasons, but fundamentally Allah wanted to show us something. This man will wake up to, into this life you know, be born into this life without a father, and a few years later, still as a young boy, lose his mother. As if to give us a very powerful lesson about nurturing somebody and making them understand, granting them wisdom. No parents around them to teach him anything. Who becomes his teacher? I ask a lot of questions right now. So, don't be shy again to answer. There's no such thing as wrong. Who's his teacher? In the absence of, of the nurturing uh, figures in his life. Allah wants to teach us something. They are not there as parents. Who becomes the teacher? Yeah, Allah. This is very powerful. He received this divine instruction from Allah purely. Purely. The rest of the prophets, you notice, have handled the same thing. They're receiving, brothers, this is divine instruction from the heavens. Allah feeding their hearts, nourishing them. Because ultimately it's about understanding. And a lot of people might acquire a lot of knowledge and information, quote for you a hadith, verses from the Quran, fiqhi opinions, but maybe none of it has been immersed into their hearts. And you see that displayed what? In what? What do you think? Where does faith really display itself? Understanding, wisdom. When I speak of wisdom, when you think of wise people, how do you know they're wise? Through what? Advice and? Here's an interaction, isn't it true? You see the embodiment of that knowledge being manifested in their behavior, in their words, 
in the positions they take. Isn't it true? And if you see that their behavior betrays what they claim to have in terms of knowledge, you say, well, uh, it's not real, right? Ultimately, brothers and sisters, whatever we understand and the knowledge we acquire, if it's not translated into wise positions in life, to really not know how to behave, to know, to know how to, what to feel even in times of difficulty. Who do you turn to in times of difficulty? What do you say? How do you deal with a person who upsets you? How do you deal with uh, happy times, good times? How do you deal with human beings across the board who are of different colors and in terms of their you know, demeanors, in terms of their behavior? That's what wisdom is about. Exercising that knowledge that you've acquired in real life, in real time. That, brothers and sisters, is what knowledge is all about. That ultimately it comes down to how we behave and how we, what kind of attitudes we have with Allah Azza wa So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, brothers and sisters, was taught by Allah Azza wa Why am I saying this? I'm saying this to tell you that as we begin this halaqa today, to learn about a subject that is beloved to Allah Azza wa Perhaps the most important subject of our lives. Rest assured that in order for you to learn tonight, to acquire something, subhanAllah, that um, that evolves your understanding of this faith that means something in your heart the one who will plan that in your heart is not my words it's Allah so you need to have that intention and, oh Allah as I sit here tonight to please you to learn I'm here for your sake ultimately because I want to get better right I want to enhance my relationship through the salah we're talking about salah today and what is salah it's the most beloved deed that Allah wants you to do it's what you connect what connects you to Allah on a daily basis your presence here says, I want to improve that. Because I want to get to know him closer. I want to please him. Ya Allah, teach me. So you're sure you're listening to me, but the teacher is Allah. If you have that intention and understanding, brothers and sisters, by Allah, every time you come and read a book, Allah will be there with you to teach you, to impart that wisdom and understanding. He'll bless your tongue. He'll bless your mind. He'll bless the words as they come into your heart. As opposed to somebody who's not depending on Allah in their journey of knowledge. Does that make sense? So that's what we begin with what? What's the the first verse of the Quran? What is it? Iqra, recite or read, but what's the continuation of it? Say it loud. Bismi Allah was the Quran, the revelation of the Quran begins with recite or read, but not just any reciting or reading. I can hold a piece of paper and read. Allah says it's not sufficient, it's not going to impart any understanding. Any enhancement of your position in life, any it's not gonna take you up to the heavens. But read it in the name of Allah, for Allah, seeking the help of Allah to see what happens. Suddenly the words come into your mind and you, and, you, and, you, and in your in your internal universe, and Allah is blessing everything that goes into you. Your mind as it processes it. You know how sometimes you read a verse from the Quran and you're like, not not I got nothing. But sometimes you might read it and subhanAllah, maybe a tear comes out of you. He says, subhanAllah, I see it. You know that seeing? From where did it come? Allah. What will make your heart see something and just grasp it. I see it. I feel, I feel, you know in the expression, I feel Allah. I feel these words. I feel the Prophet. I can see him. This seeing is from Allah and that's what we're talking about. It doesn't matter what you learn. You might learn from me, from me a few ahadith today. A few, uh, whatever, good facts that you can share with others. But it really doesn't matter if you're not seeing. If it's not meaning something for you emotionally, nothing. Brothers, this is all we do and all we talk about. Returns back to two fundamental things. Love of Allah first and love of the Prophet If you really want to ask, why are we suffering in faith? Why are we not doing enough for Allah? Why am I having this kind of very, uh, kind of, subhanAllah, like, like cold feeling about maybe my own faith? I, I don't feel the, the warmth of it. It's all about one thing. We're, it's all about really returning back to whether or not we love Allah sufficiently enough. And the reason of why we don't love Him as much as we should is goes back to another fundamental fact which is, do we know Allah enough? Do we know the Prophet ﷺ enough? If you come to know them enough, you cannot help but love them. That's why a lot of people struggle with their salah. Because they're not coming to meet Allah the Beloved. They're not seeing themselves in front of the Divine. In front of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. They're just another ritual. Isn't it true? Ask yourself, how do you come to the Salah? How do I come to the Salah? It's another thing I have to do. Isn't it true? When I say to you, you have a meeting with, I always like to use the figure of a president. And now it's Obama, right? Could be somebody else next year. But I say to you, imagine you just received 
an invitation. Not even you asking. Invitation from Obama to meet you on Monday next week. Say, you have a meeting with me. Would you like to come? And I'm telling you, well, first of all, like, what's the natural answer? Oh, are you kidding me? Really? Me meet the president? Seriously? But what kind of preparation do you do that? Do you do for that meeting between now and Sunday, and then into Monday? I'm asking. Probably your entire thought will be on this meeting, preparing for it, thinking about the subject you want to raise with him, and it's probably around some need, right? He's gonna tell you, you're like, you know what? You come to me, ask me for anything, and I'll do my best to grant you what you're looking for. You're gonna be thinking of all the things you want to ask. On that day, how will you dress? You just pick up anything that you go to the class with? No, brother, sister, you're gonna be putting on your best looks and putting on the best appearance, make sure you shower, you, you know, fix your clothes, you know, brothers combing your hair, or, you know what I'm saying, right? We put on perfume or cologne, be on our, at our best, concentrating fully. But imagine, brothers and sisters, normally we want to meet with somebody important, what do we do? Oh, we have to go through somebody, multiple layers, right? Maybe we'll get five minutes or 10 minutes, maybe. And you know when the person is listening to you, that important person is probably thinking, finish, right? Have something else to attend to. And if you, imagine if there are multiple people in the room. Do you really, can you get your point across? You're probably like thinking, when do I get my turn? Because the person can process one thing at a time. And they're probably nodding, like every time you get, you know, you meet to, you know, a politician or something. I, it's two days ago, I was uh, at an event, and there was a governor of Maryland. It was not like a big group of people, but I looked at him like, I mean, look at all these people around him. Everybody's trying to get, like, for him to just nod and say, how are you, right? He meets you know, millions of people, right? He doesn't know you or me. I mean, really? Like, I greeted him, and I'm like, all right, like, okay. So, I mean, it's just, you're another human being for him, even if he smokes. His mind is just, he's a human being. So, brothers and sisters, imagine the level of attention and focus we give to just meeting a human being that we think is important. On a daily basis, brothers and sisters, Allah, the King of Kings, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, is telling us the following. He can meet with me anytime, any place, talk to me about any subject, for as long as you want, without going to a secretary or a prophet, no intermediaries, no begging somebody. Now, anytime, just make wudu and say Allah. Do we get that, brothers and sisters? If we're not getting that, that we're meeting with the divine Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, first and foremost, rest assured our salah will be an empty experience right away. But before we begin, brothers and sisters, even talking about khushu'a and the salah and elevating it, what is salah about? Why did Allah Azza even put for us the salah to perform? Brothers and sisters, the word salah in itself, Arabic, terms, all of them, the vocabulary of Arabic, comes back to roots, three to four letter roots. Some of you who don't speak Arabic know this, right? What's the root of the word salah? Sila, right? What's sila? What does it mean? Connection, right? Connection. Imagine, brothers and sisters, Allah has instituted salah for us to simply get to know Him and connect with Him. Now I ask you the question, does Allah need our connection? Does He need us? He's always existed, ever existing, self-sufficient, self-subsisting, the all-powerful, the almighty, the all-wise, the all-knowledgeable. He doesn't need anything or anyone. He stands by Himself. So the connection and the getting to know Allah is for us. And Allah loves us so much, brothers and sisters, He wants us to hover around Him. Because we suffer when we're not around Him. I love a saying by Ibn al-Qayyim. By the way, if I sat down, this will be okay, right? On my, across my feet, right? Be okay, inshallah. So Ibn al-Qayyim says, beautiful saying, brothers and sisters, because Allah, if we understand what the salah provides for our souls and hearts, we'll be racing to it. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, if you come sincerely to Allah with a heart that desires Allah, in your salah, I am telling you, brothers and sisters, instant transformation in your life. You know all these struggles we have with deen, with Allah, I don't know where to begin, I don't know what to learn. People get overwhelmed. I have problems in life, struggles, relationship issues. What do I do? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, the accumulation of all the knowledge of Islam comes back to 
Comic wudu, hit the, hit the prayer. Expecting the most from Allah and expecting Allah to deliver you out of everything. And guide your heart and enlighten you. Right away, Allah does not joke around, brothers and sisters, with sincere people. But because we fail to understand what this salah is about, that's why we continue to struggle. And we leave the salah in the same condition we started with, don't we? How many of us, brothers and sisters, we leave the salah and we're feeling like, wow, I feel like I was in the heavens. I mean, it's not like I'm smiling now, I feel refreshed, empowered, I see the way. Healing, I feel like my heart has been healed. I've entered the salah perhaps with a heart that is aching. Tired from my professors, my family, friends, life that is exhausting me. And this salah, I went into it, five minutes, I'm like, wow, I'm healed. Brothers and sisters, if we're not saying this, our salah is not the experience Allah wanted us to have. Very simple. Yet it is the healing. It is the key. It is that transformation that has to turn our lives around every time we hit the salah. So Allah says five times a day, I want you to come and meet with me. Because your soul needs it. So Ibn al-Qayyim was saying, al-arwahu jawala, that the souls of human beings uh, hover and move about. Move about what? He says literally, your souls hover, hover around places. He says, so either your soul hovers, it's one of two places. Either it's hovering in the heavens or hovering in places where people relieve themselves. Like, you could say around trash, if you will. Your soul, literally, your body is here. So your soul, sure, you say, it's inside, my heart is inside. No, your heart is hovering. Either around the, the affairs of this world, or it's hovering with the divine. It's somewhere else. It's occupied with something. Think, what, what is your heart thinking about most of the time? What is your... The thing you, you go to sleep with, when you go to bed, brothers and sisters, you put your head on your pillow. What are you thinking about? That tells you where your soul is hovering. Either affairs of this world or, Ya Allah, my soul is taken tonight. Every time you sleep, as Allah tells us in the Quran, your soul is taken. SubhanAllah. So Allah, if He wants you to die, He never returns a soul. And if you are to live, He returns a soul back by the time you wake up, your soul is back. Brothers and sisters, you're dying every time you go to sleep. Your soul may never return back. Think about that. So where is it hovering? Are you thinking, Allah, oh Allah, you just took my soul, it may never return back. I might be with you, this could be my last day. In the name of Allah, I put my head and I sleep. A soul thinking about Allah is hovering around the throne of Allah. Oh, you're thinking like, maybe the problem that you just finished with, you know, fighting with your spouse or parent or, you know, something stressful and you're only, or something bad. Where are your thoughts? And that tells you where your soul is. So he says, it's either hovering around the heavens or hovering around garbage or in places where you relieve yourself. And indeed, brothers and sisters, some souls, that's all they hover around. And I ask you, if your soul is hovering in a place, I don't know, butcher's shop, not your soul, physically, forget about souls. You actually go physically and hang around, you know, for at least a couple of hours a day in a butcher's shop. Slaughters meat and chops off meat. How do you smell when you get out? Like me, very simple. Imagine if you hang out, hang out in that place daily. I mean, one day will probably give you enough of a stench or smell for days. Imagine on a daily basis, five times you go visit the butcher and spend five, 10 minutes, eventually you're gonna smell like meat, no doubt. Brothers and sisters, if you, if you hover and literally stand around the garbage all the time, literally, like just go to a, I don't know, in a garbage truck or around the garbage, a garbage can, you just feel like, I like to hang out here. I like to study here, <laughs> my phone conversations here. You know, it works. How will you smell? Well, by Allah, like garbage, right? That smell will attach itself to your body. I want you to think, brothers and sisters, if you're meeting Allah five times a day, knowing it's a connection with Allah, where your soul has to be elevated to Allah. It's literally, if you're thinking about Salah seriously, coming with intent. To meet Allah, Allah elevates your soul to be around the throne of Allah. Five times a day minimum. How will your soul smell? Heaven. By Allah. It's like somebody showering five times a day, but in the heavens. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, do you now understand why Allah has us five visiting Him five times a day? Because your soul has to hover around it to be healthy, to be nourished, to overcome its stress and anxiety, 
for it to be fed. Where did the soul come from, brothers and sisters? And this is very critical for you to understand because we're suffering, we're struggling, and we need help. Brothers and sisters, if your body is aching, you know, get a, you get a description, a prescription, you know what you need, medicine. If you're physically exhausted, you go to sleep. Let's get some rest. Our souls are aching, and we don't know what the treatment of it is, and we know it. You feel it in your heart, it's like aching, it's anxious, and it's not feeling better. How do you know? Well, check out where it comes from. Bodies come from earth, so they need food and drink to be sustained. It needs rest and sleep. But the sleep is ibadah, that's why. Because Allah says, you need to sleep to be able to perform your duties and functions in life. Go get some rest. rest is, resting is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. SubhanAllah, your body needs it. Even to do salah, you, you need to have rested, right? Otherwise you cannot even concentrate. Critical. So you know what your body needs. And you know, that's, you know when it breaks, there's a threshold, you feel like, you know what, I need to get out of all activities, I need to rest. Now the soul is aching and screaming, and we just have no idea what to give it. So how do we know what to give it? Well, it doesn't come from earth. Where did the soul come from? In the original story of creation. Allah did what to Adam? He created the body, molded it with his hand, and did what? He breathed into it. Breath from Allah that gave him life. So where did it come from? From Allah. The heavens. From Allah. It's not a creature of this earth. It's, there's peace of you from the heaven, brothers and sisters. Peace of you from earth, your flesh and blood. But there is something inside of you, a jewel, that didn't come from here. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, you, peace of you is from Jannah, from up there. And it cannot get nourishment from earth. So Allah says it needs to hover around me to get its food and get its relief. And, and say that I'm happy. And it puts you at peace. If you, so if you ask yourself, why am I not getting security and peace in my life? Your soul is not hovering around the right place. And you don't even know that it's hungry. So the daily intake for the soul is hover around Allah for those five daily prayers. So if we come to the salah and the mind and the body is not in the salah, what's happening to the soul? It's, it's not going to the place to get its nourishment. Because your mind is somewhere else, your heart is somewhere else. The heart is what feeds it ultimately. So if the heart is occupied with earth, at a time when the soul needs to be eating, similar to you sitting on your, at your table, supposed to be eating, but you're on the phone. And you keep doing that every day. Well, it's going to happen to your body. It's going to break. You need the food. But you're hungry. You know what to do. Soul is hungry, but we don't know what to do. And we come to the salah strands, like subhanAllah, overcome by life. And we're running away from it to get the healing, but we forget the soul and still think about life. So we leave the salah in the same condition. It becomes a rich. I have to do salah. If you reach a point in your life where you say, I have to do salah because it's a requirement, you've missed the point of salah. It's the point of salah. Very simple, brothers and sisters. Very simple. And subhanAllah, just to illustrate you how important salah is. Our entire life experience, our journey from beginning to end. And brothers and sisters, you have an appointment with the angel of death. No change about it. Nothing will alter that appointment. You're getting closer to it today. You're one day closer to it than yesterday. SubhanAllah, last, last week I knew two individuals. One of them is a very close friend of mine who passed away. Both from cancer, one on Tuesday, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. On Tuesday, this is a very close friend of mine. Tuesday he passed away, and the sister that was in the room next to him, also from cancer, she had breast cancer. She's only 35 years old, not, old, not an old sister. She, he dies on th Tuesday, she dies on Wednesday. She has two little kids, and he's a... <coughs> SubhanAllah, everybody looks at him as one of the pillars of this beautiful man. One of the most wonderful human beings I've known in my life. SubhanAllah. He left a tremendous impact on the community in Frederick. That's where he is, Frederick, Maryland. Man, brother, sisters who left Wallahi with almost no money. I know his home just has small television, he has a wife. I wrote his will with him. And <clears throat> he gave me the instructions of what he wanted at his funeral. He asked me to take care of a few things for him. And then I said, well, brother, you need to tell me what you've left for your family and to write him down. He said, brother Tarif, you know I have nothing. I have nothing. And you know what, brother, sisters, he's one of the happiest people I've ever known in my life. One of the most tranquil, by Allah. Never had that home or that car, none of these things that we, 
we, we search after. None of them. And he was one of the happiest people I've known. Even in his sickness. Wallahi, he was healing people. I learned from this guy. And subhanAllah, he came a day and subhanAllah, you know, they were told him of his imminent death a few months ago. He said, you know, it's over. They stopped the treatment. He said, that's it. It couldn't happen any time. Indeed, he, he died. Not too long, just last Tuesday. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it was one of the most subhanAllah, powerful experiences on me. I helped in his washing. And it was an experience like not, not any other. Not like any other. And the reason is, I go back to soul of body. I saw a body without a soul. And you know when you wash it? It's not like even a, it's like, not like a body anymore. It's not like the human beings you see around. SubhanAllah, the soul has left. Back to Allah Azza And that, notice where they go. A soul goes to Allah, the body goes back to its home. Where? Earth. You bury, this, you bury the body, and the soul goes back to its mother. Heaven. Where it came from? With Allah. Your soul is going back, brothers and sisters. So if it's not getting to know Allah in the Salah, how will it meet Allah? Does that make sense? So the Salah is your connection on a daily basis for the soul to be nourished from the heavens, from Allah, to hover around the heavenly place, the throne of Allah to get that smell and that relief and that nourishment and that Iman and that what I call feeling good to sustain yourself through life. But in your Salah, you're getting to know Allah. And what are you doing? You're talking. Remember the meeting I told you about the important person you meet? You talk to them. If I ask you, brothers and sisters, in your entire journey of life, is a preparation to be with Allah for the soul to return back to paradise. And by the way, brothers and sisters, Allah created you, designed you to only find pleasure and bliss in what place? Where? Jannah. That's why if you ask yourself, why am I tired? Because you're not in your home. And if you want to make this place your home, it's not going to work. Your soul cannot function and be happy and, um, and, and, and blissful, except in its home, it's paradise. Allah created you to live in paradise. So ask a fish, why can't you live on, you know, outside on earth? It says, I can't live there. I need my water. I need my oxygen. Your soul, is, its oxygen is in paradise. That's why our souls will never rest on earth. So what the soul is doing here, brothers and sisters, and what we ought to be doing is getting soul, this soul ready, our, ourselves ready to be in our home, our final destination. And indeed, that could be a destination or the other alternative. Hellfire. One of two abodes. Your soul wants heaven, wants paradise. And one of the interesting things that I've, subhanAllah, I came across that illustrates how, what is waiting for us and how much your soul longs to be with Allah and in paradise. It's narrated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when Allah admits us into paradise, imagine the days opening in front of you, you step into paradise. Automatically, you know where your home is. Imagine, like, imagine if you've never seen your home, and I tell you go to your home, and without you ever being there, you just go there. No Google Maps, none of these things, no navigation system, you just go. And then when you open the door for the first time, in your home on earth, you say, you know what? I feel like I've always been living there. Does that come to us? No. No, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know your home. And if it's a strange home, you know that it's not your home. The Prophet says that when you enter paradise and go to your home, you will feel when you enter your home that you're more familiar with that home than your home where? On earth. How does that happen? Allah will make you feel as if you've been living there. Because it's your home. The home that you've always been designed to live in. But we make earth our home. Or we forget about our home. Your soul wants to be back from us. Be back, I say. Not be there for the first time. Your father Adam came from paradise. And it's a journey of returning back to paradise to be with So any side tracks or side paths will take you away from your path back to Jannah. Don't forget where you're going. And the Salah brothers and sisters, this is the key point. If I tell you, you know, going back to the analogy of... Uh, Meeting somebody important. I mean, all of us really want to get to know important people on earth. Isn't it true? And don't tell me, no, I don't want to know anybody important. Right? If for nothing else but to get support and help at what time? Why do we need important people? Why do we care? Because if you're ever in what? Give me an example. In need, right? You know who to call. You open your phone and say, I'm going to call the, I don't know, the chief of police. or I know them. Or, you know, they, they can do this thing for me in no time. It's just a phone call. And you know when you know these people well, they'll tell you, call me anytime. Anything you need, I'll deliver for you. 
You know what I'm talking about, correct? Imagine if you know the president of the university, this university is very well. Well, if something happens, and you had a conflict with a professor, you can go and say, listen, you know me. I mean, you know me well. Come on, take care. Say, don't worry about it. I know you well. No, no, no worries. Let's go home and rest. I built that, I built that relationship. But you know, if you don't know that person well, and you need them, you go to them, and you say, I, I really need your help. Say, I, I don't know you. I mean, why should I you know, do anything special for you? I don't know you. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, I want you to imagine. Allah gave us an opportunity on a daily basis to get to know Him and converse with Him. How do you get to know somebody? You actually meet with them and start having what? Dialogue. How are you? Who are you? What, you know, tell me about you. It's an exchange. And you, through the exchange, you grow together as companions. But if somebody is just talking to you and you're like, your mind is somewhere else constantly, just you have not built a relationship. But you know that the more you talk to a human being, spend special time with them, especially by yourselves. You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, you know, spouses, uh, before they get married, they know they don't want somebody to be in the vicinity when they're talking. They want to get to know each other. They're going to be married to each other. Does that make sense? So they need to spend some special time together in their engagement, you know, and so forth to get to know each other. Leave us alone. And in the, you know, in, even in, in marriage, well, a good marriage, it stays, and bad marriage only initially. <laughs> the spending of the special time. But you know what I'm talking about. People you love you spend time with, and you get to know them more and more, more intimately as you spend more time with them. I ask you, brothers and sisters, if on earth Allah tells us five times a day, please, please, look, look at this. The king of the king is telling me, please come and get to know me. Because one day, you're going to see me. I want you to imagine on a day that Allah describes as the heaviest day. Yawm al He says, such a heavy day when your fate is decided. Brothers and sisters, the day of judgment is a day when your fate is decided, either Jannah or Hellfire. This is not a joke. I'm not talking graduating with a degree or not graduating. Brothers and sisters, I'm talking Jannah. You realize if you see it, I could be in Jannah permanently, eternally, or just Hellfire. Eternal. Not a joke. When we come to that point, we're going to be brothers and sisters running for our lives. All that we think about is making it. So, Imagine on that day, brothers and sisters, when it's the heaviest. And people are scrambling. And then you get called. And you know that I'm in trouble. And your name is called to meet Allah. Meet who? Allah has to talk to him. And you could call back and you say, it's fine. I never, who, who's Allah again? Like, I know he's the creator, but I don't know him. I never met him. I never had a dialogue with him. I never took time out of my uh -huh. day to spend that special time with him. You know what I'm talking about, right? Salah. To connect and get to know him. Remember what I said. The more you spend time with somebody, the more you get to know them, the more they get to know you, the more you build the relationship. I never had a relationship with him. Now I have to confront him and see him and beg him and plead with him to put me in Jannah and save me from the hellfire, but I don't know him. And people will be saying, you're meeting Allah, you say, who is Allah? I don't know Allah. I know he's... Like the Creator is God, but I never had anything with Allah as with Him. And similarly, Allah will be telling you when He looks at you, you've been blind to me. Today you're blind, blinded so that you don't even see Allah because you never got to know Allah. What I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters, before you think of anything else, your salah is your vehicle to establish relationship with Allah so that you're ready for for Him when you see Him and you say, Oh Allah. Now, if you imagine, if you've done your salah, you build the relationship, you. You've had your concentration, your khushu, and you, salah was for you was, wow, the time I look forward to in my day to meet my beloved, Allah, my Lord, my Creator. And you know so intimately that on the day of judgment, they tell you, come to meet Allah, you say, what? Can't wait. I remember Allah, I spent time with Allah in my nights, in my days. I woke up in the morning thinking about Him. I went to bed thinking about Him. I spent my time with Him in my salah. I know Allah, I'm not, I'm not afraid. And indeed, Allah gives you that feeling of safety. So that you're not scared on that day because you know him and he knows you. And imagine when he sees you, he says, don't worry, I know you. You love me. You spend time with me. You're under my shade. Don't worry about anything. Brothers and sisters, think of meeting Allah whether you really know Allah or not. And the place where you judge it is in your soul. If the salah is empty, meaningless, ritualistic, mechanical, <coughs> you've not come or invest yourself an inch in getting to know Allah. Literally, Allah is coming to meet you. 
<coughs> and your mind is somewhere else, your heart is somewhere else, you've not talked to Allah. And the hadith says, as soon as you say Allahu Akbar, <coughs> Allah sets his face towards your face. Imagine. <coughs> Individually, <coughs> privately, one on one, he's looking at you to talk to you. Now imagine you say Allahu Akbar, Allah's greater than anything else. But now my heart starts thinking of school, about this person, about what I have to do next, about tomorrow, about my mother and father, about my kids, and everything but Allah. At a time when you're meeting with Allah, the hadith says right away, Allah turns his face away. He says it's Talk to yourself. You're talking to yourself. You're getting to know yourself probably more. But not Allah. Now imagine all the salahs like this. That's why brothers and sisters, we never move spiritually. We never hover around Allah. And we leave smelling the same way. Because the salah was empty. That's what salah is, brothers and sisters. The Prophet ﷺ tells us it's the key to everything. It's the key to your Jannah. <laughs> You're entering to Jannah rest first and foremost on the Salah. How much you've connected with Allah on earth. Not just fulfilled an obligation. No. Gotten closer to the beloved. Your Savior, your Creator, your, your caretaker, your nurturer. That's what Allah is, brothers and sisters. We can't make it without Him. He cares about you so much, loves you so much. He wants to get to know you more. He knows you, but He wants you to get to know Him. To show you how merciful He is. How much He wants to put you in Jannah. We don't know Allah, brothers and sisters. And because we don't know how great He is, we don't think about it when we come to the Salah. Because if we knew who He is, remember if you're meeting Obama, you'll be like, full attention, full concentration. I don't want him to, I don't want him to miss anything, or me miss anything. Maybe He'll look at me and be merciful with me. Right? How about if you go to the Salah the same way? Ya Allah, I'm here for you. I'm sincerely coming to see Allah turn my life around. Fill my heart. Fill my heart. Brothers and sisters, Allah takes care of those who disbelieve Him. Gives them food and drink. Really, He cares about them as well. Gives them His mercy on them. Imagine. Imagine a human being looking at you with a gaze of mercy. You know the stories, even from our lives, when somebody like doesn't even know you, comes out of nowhere and saves you. Can you think of people in your life who has done that one time to you? Like seriously, somebody, even sometimes a stranger, or somebody close to you, like, you know what? They're for you when you need it. And you cannot thank them enough. Can you think of somebody? Just raise your hand. Like, and then think of somebody and raise your hand. Seriously. I want you to think of that individual. Raise your hand. Okay, I have similar. Brothers and sisters, this is a human being who looked at you and sympathized with you enough that he was there for you, fully supportive, giving you what you needed, plucking you out of problems. What if with the <coughs> Creator of the heavens and earth looks at you with sympathy and mercy. What will happen? If a human being, as poor as we are, can help each other and probably, <clears throat> you know, somebody can be fully like enriched by somebody. Maybe he'll give you enough money to live the rest of your life and be su sufficed. Or get you out of trouble. Really serious trouble. That's a human being. What if when Allah looks at you and says, You're mine. You're my eyes. When you come and please Him. What do you expect to get? Oh, brothers and sisters, this is the generous. The generous who does not turn anybody away. If you go to <coughs> a house of a generous host, you know generous people? You know any generous person in your life? If you don't know any generous, there's a problem. So raise your hand if you know any generous person. Well, let's just think like, I know this person so generous. When you go to their home, how do they treat you? Do you leave other than empty stomach? Yeah, seriously. <coughs> You don't need, no, they'll like stuff you, stuff you with food, right? They're all over you when you come in. When you need them, you call them like they're there for you. I need money, money here, here's money, food, it doesn't matter. You know, you call them, they're there for you. Generous people, brothers and sisters, who gave them that generosity? Allah, Allah calls Himself Al Karim. They are gen he is generosity itself. Do you expect when you go to His home, you're coming to meet Him, to leave empty? Oh, that's not a good thought of Allah, by the way. Allah says, I am as you think of me. If you're going, thinking that I'm going now to the generous, the most merciful, you can never leave your salah the same way, brothers and sisters, that you enter with. You have to live with someone. So what do the scholars say? They say, go to Allah in your salah with a heart that is just yearning for, for Allah to fill your heart with treasures. Just as you go to a house of a generous person and expect to get out with money or food, whatever. But here you're looking for something greater. You'll never leave 
empty. But how do we go to Allah in the Salah? Is the mind there to ask? No. Heart there? No. We're totally not in the Salah, and then we expect to get out with something. Brother says, it's like passing a treasure or a house of a generous person, just looking at it, and then looking somewhere else. We've just missed the treasure. The generosity of the giver, Allah Azza wa It's a field of treasures you come to visit five times a day. And we keep leaving empty-handed because we're not looking at it. The generous, brothers and sisters, you are with the generous, the most powerful, the most giving. Your caretaker who provided for the heavens and the earth, even the ant gives from his provision. Do you think Allah, if you ask, will ever say, I'm not going to give you? No, brothers and sisters, never. It's not the quality of the generous. Just as generous people on earth, well, if you don't have money, they'll give you. If they have food, they'll split it in half. <coughs> it's their quality. So how about the generous, the most generous? It's not befitting of him. He chose for himself not to ever, ever turn down the request of somebody asking. Never. And on top of it, he gives you more. He'll never just leave you like this. But if we're not searching for it, we leave empty. And if our minds are not with him in the Salah, we leave empty. Imagine, not only that, that, even brothers and sisters, the sins, troubles that we have, all of us have issues, right? And nobody is perfect. He chose for us, Azza wa Jal, for us to be people who make mistakes and flaws and commit sins. It's, it's His will. It doesn't mean we say we're going to will because He chose for us to sin. No. But we are prone to error. Imagine the generosity of Allah. He says, don't worry. I gave you the salah to cleanse you. So the hadith of the Prophet says, he's telling his companions, imagine if somebody lives by a river, at the back of a river, his home is right Five times a day, he goes into the river and washes himself or herself. Five times a day. He says, will he ever be dirty? The Sahaba said, the companions of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi said, oh, Prophet, Allah, never. Five times a day, he's showering in the river. He says, so is the person making this Allah. Completely cleansed from all their sins. Brother, this is an you really think about. You know those things you're struggling with? Like, how can Allah forgive you? Go hit the Salah, sincerely. The promise is that it cleanses everything between it, before it. Okay, after Fajr, I did something else. Duhur comes and look forward to the forgiveness of Allah. The Prophet says, it cleans you. You go to Duhur and you can expect, if you're sincere, to come out clean. You go to Asr, you expect to come out clean. Maghrib, and imagine, so imagine continual shower. Who will give you that? Except the generous. So it's a tool of cleansing. It elevates your soul. It makes you hover around Allah's throne. Get cleaned. Purified. Relief. What else do we want, brothers and sisters? From the King of Kings without intermediary, at your choice, at your time, as long as you want. Meet with me. I mean, here, if somebody gives us a meeting, as I said, five, ten minutes, max. Allah says, talk to me as much as you want. I will never turn away. One on one. You, cho you choose the subject. You choose what you want to ask me about. You choose the length of the meeting and the place. And I'm there right away. How do we treat Allah by the Do we look for these things? Of course. But that's why we're not there in the Salat to read the fruits and the benefits. One of the most beautiful meanings, brothers and sisters, about Salah itself, as I said, the Prophet said, it's your key to your heaven, to, to paradise, to your home in Jannah. If you do it well, it puts you in paradise. It's the pillar of deen, meaning that if, it's, if you mess up Salah, you mess up your whole faith. You, you bless, you just disconnected from Allah. Remember the day when you meet Him and, I, and you say, I don't know Him. But this is, you cannot fail in the Salah. Wallahi, SubhanAllah, I keep having this conversation between me and my wife. We always say like, listen, we can fail at anything in life. Compromise on anything, but Salah cannot be compromised. And we're just trying to remind each other. Fail at anything. It doesn't matter. Don't fail Salah. This is your key, brothers. This is, don't expect to function normal, to feel normal, to make it on this earth or in the hereafter and your salah is a mess. Either by not doing it, taking it lightly when Allah invites you to come and meet Him, you say, I don't have something better. I have something better, oh my Lord. But I want at the same time to help me. You just turn away the invite, the invite of the King of Kings, who says, come for your own benefit. I'm waiting. And you say, well, no, uh, later in life. And I like this when I hear it from Muslim, later when I get, like later, when I get old, well, I have guarantees. And if your attitude, you're not appreciating Allah enough to honor yourself by being with Allah, you're not getting it. Or by delaying the prayers. Or maybe combining 
without even an excuse. Fair is just another thing I have to get, you know, get out of my way. It's, maybe it's actually, you know, it's time that I have to, you know, get away from the important things and, and that's it. Brothers and sisters, that means your whole faith is a mess. Your heart is going to be a mess. SubhanAllah, no joke about it. The Prophet ﷺ says, The pleasure of my heart, my soul, my eyes is in the salah. What does that tell you? He goes into the salah expecting healing. He comes out of the salah. If he's anxious, he's relieved. If he's stressed out, he's now comfortable. If he's afraid, he's secure. It restores you back to yourself. It's your compass in life. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, how beautiful salah is if we understood it. Look at how merciful Allah your entirety, where's your mind? In your work, important things, nonetheless. Like, they're important. You're doing your work, that's important. Your studies, it's a worship, form of worship. You know, you're taking care of your parents, you're, you're earning a, a living. Whatever it is that you're doing that is clean and good, is a good thing. But your mind is not there. Allah says, or you could be doing other things that displease Allah, it doesn't matter, whatever you're doing. But your heart and mind is somewhere else. Allah says, I'll make sure your mind gets back to me so that you forget, you don't forget where you're going. Because we can easily be sidetracked and go somewhere else in life, right? How do you get back on your path? Salah. Salah, brothers and sisters, you notice what it should do for you is allow you to reorient your mind and heart on whom? Allah. So that if you're angry and yelling and screaming, Salah comes back to Allah. You forgot about the hereafter, you're home in Jannah, you're busy with life, you're angry, you don't have enough money, you don't have a spouse, you don't have this and that. Salah so comes, Alhamdulillah, I'm going back to Allah. Reminding who Allah is. Reorient your focus on Allah. Allah doesn't need to do that for you. He makes it for you and me. Because we make it when we're thinking about Allah. So it allows you to connect with the hereafter, to reconnect with life, to reconnect your, with your purpose on life, on life and on earth. It's like somebody you need to keep knocking back to thinking about what they should be doing. That's Allah for you, brothers and sisters. It allows you to go focus back on your the true meaning of your life, Allah Azza wa Bring him back to the center. So if you're not doing salah, you'll remain distracted. It's the best way to bring you back and remind you of Allah Azza wa Make sense? Please stop inshallah if you have any questions as I proceed through this. Now, another point that highlights how important salah is. Because brother says we do not appreciate how important salah is to Allah. That's why we cannot mess with salah. Like if somebody is messing with salah, they're not praying, pray for them. Wallahi, pray for them. Because they're in serious trouble with themselves. Their lives are in trouble. In this life and in the hereafter, they continue to struggle here. Their homes will struggle. Their relationships will struggle. Their children will struggle. And they'll struggle in the hereafter. Pray for them. If you're not, pray for yourself. And instantly change. And by the way, brothers and sisters, I always say, if you're looking to change, it's instantaneous. If you are. That's the formula of Allah. He doesn't say, you have to do A, B, C, and go learn Bukhari, Muslim, read 10 chapters of the Quran, uh, study under Shaykh for a semester, and then I'll see if I can take you. What does Allah say? Right now, right now, turn your heart to me. Sincerely, cry. Ask, and I'll be there for you. I'll turn your heart around. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, try it. If you're struggling with anything, your faith, your relationship with Allah, anything, go make wudu clean, real, good wudu. Go with a heart that is yearning, that cries for Allah's love. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, Allah will transform you right away if you continue on with them. That's how loving and merciful Allah. This is, brothers and sisters, Allah dealing with you, not a human being, not harsh, unmerciful, unkind people who are sometimes good to you and sometimes not good. That's why, brothers and sisters, if you don't have the relationship with Allah, the one who really cares about you, who will never fail you, people can fail you. People are sometimes happy with you and sometimes they're not happy. You know how it is. Your parents are the same. Everybody. Isn't it true? Your spouse. Sometimes they're happy, sometimes they're not happy. Your children, same thing. You spend 18 years, 19 years, sleepless nights, taking care of them, and then say, I'm mar marrying now. I don't, I don't even know. Leave me alone. I'm grateful. Allah will never treat you like this. That's why if you don't have Him in your life, you have a broken life. Broken life, brothers and sisters. You're searching for something that will never fulfill. Allah will fulfill. So to signify how important this salah is, look at what happens. What's the son of the Prophet said when we have children? When you have a child, you hold him in your hand, 
the husband is supposed to do this. What's the first thing they are commanded to do with the, with the child? Right out of the belly of the mother. Hold him. And do what? In his wife's ear? What? Adam. What's Adam? Call really to prayer, but I like to say call to meet Allah. Because Salah is meeting Allah. Isn't it amazing that the first words that have to be said to the mind of a child that we don't think understands anything. It doesn't articulate, it doesn't, hear, it doesn't understand anything. It just came into the world crying. And the first words that go into his mouth is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than anything. Allah is greater than anything. You repeat it, Ashhadu an la ilaha. I bear witness. There's no God but Allah Muhammad is his prophet. Then it says, Hayya ala salah. Come to life. Subhanallah, come to the salah, come to the salah, come to life, come to life. First thing that gets said to the child, Salah, Salah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Then you go to the left ear and you say what? A calm. As if the life has commenced, the relationship with Allah has commenced, your prayer has commenced. SubhanAllah. The first thing in life is an adab, a call to the prayer, call to meet Allah for the child. Life begins. Child learns, you empower them, you teach them to, to ultimately, first, fundamental brothers and sisters, do it with your children, do it with your spouses. Salah as salah. The last words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his bed before he died, as salat as salah, his ummah. He says, You will not make it without salah. You've lost Allah. You're going to be confused and, and directionless. You will not find your home in Jannah. Salat as salah. Right? That's what you do with your child. Hopefully, the child grows up and starts to do salah. And that becomes the center of his life or her life. Then they go and die. I did it twice last week. Two people. One of them very close to me, as I said. We washed them. Then took him to the masjid and did what? It's the thing you do before burying. Janazah prayer. Salah on them. On them. It's not Allah, but on them. Isn't that amazing? What's the first thing we did with him? That friend of mine, the first thing that gets, subhanAllah, in his case, he actually converted. It never got sent to him. But for somebody normal who grows up in a Muslim family, the first thing that gets sent to you in your ear is Adhan, Iqamah, and the end of your life is wrapped with one. Salah on you. Your whole life is wrapped up in what? Salah. Adhan, isn't it symbolically beautiful? Adhan and Iqama, you probably cannot remember, you'll never remember. Maybe in the hereafter you, subhanAllah, maybe Allah will make you, I think Allah will make you go back and see them. Because in that realm, we'll really grasp reality as we should. We'll be able to see like as a movie our lives. And really grasp the inner depths and meanings of everything. With, imagine you know you see a 3D movie, you're living in it. This is, I would call this a super multi-dimensional movie of your life. You'll be in it. Your deeds will come to life. Be manifested in real time. You'll see yourself, you know, coming out of the belly of your mother. The words, you'll be subhanAllah recalling them. And you'll see the manifestation and meaning of everything. But your life ends with the salah, brothers and sisters. Salah on you. Even if somebody didn't pray, you saw on them. SubhanAllah. Amazing brothers, is this Allah tells you your whole life is wrapped in it. If you if you failed it in the middle, you failed yourself. You've been called to salah when you were born. And people perform the salah as the final act. And before the salah on the subhanAllah brothers and sisters, amazing meaning. Before the burial, the salat al janazah, before the salah, what do we do with the dead person? Wash them as if it's symbolic of the wudu. Even the salah on them was not just done like this. They have, you actually, when you wash the, the body of a, the, the deceased, you actually not only just wash it, you actually make wudu for him. So last week, we had to you know, hold his hand, make wudu for him. Normal wudu. And then you wash them completely. SubhanAllah, getting them ready for the salah to meet Allah in a state of what? Purity. Because guess how you'll be identified on the Day of Judgment as a believer who did salah? If you did salah, you'll be identified. How? Who knows? Signs of wudu, where? Forehead, light coming out. There's a sun. You wash your head, all the, your face all the time, there will be light coming out of your forehead. You wash your feet all the time, light coming out of your feet. There will be signs, and the Prophet ﷺ will look at them and say, come here, you, by name. Identify brothers. Imagine some people, like, Allah knows, maybe Muslim, they'll never have the signs. They never connect with Allah. Every time they were called to the Adan, they said, I don't have time. And imagine them biting with their hands, Turn me back for one rock. Brothers and sisters, when people die, they'll say, when the veil is removed and they see the reality of the hereafter, that's it, it's over. There's no return. Your soul is with Allah. Your soul right away goes to the heaven. 
according to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you die. The soul of the believer goes elevated by angels in a procession that goes to the highest heaven. And Allah says, write the name of my servant in the book of the righteous. There is a register with the name of the righteous people. Imagine in the heavens. He says, write his or her name. Return him back to earth. For from earth I created him or her. To earth I return him back in the burial, under earth, and from earth I shall resurrect him again. Your soul goes back, but ultimately it's happy. It knows, it saw the heavens. SubhanAllah, that's it. And the signs will be there. When the Prophet looks at you, he can identify you with that sign. And you'll be so happy. Like, I pray to Allah. <coughs> but brothers and sisters, once you die, everybody will wish to go back and just pay one additional rock. Imagine if you've never prayed. If you came, came to the prayer lazy. We all do it, I know. We need to just get better and try to strive and struggle. Allah is forgiving. None of us are going to have perfect, complete prayers. But it's what your heart wants. It's a matter of us striving to just get better. We'll get better, get a little bit, you know, we can. It's okay. It's a journey of growth. But ask Allah for help in it. And realize what, what it is. The worst thing with you, between you and Allah is for you not to appreciate what He gives you. If you treat the Salah or anything He gives you, is like, ah, ah, it's not bad. I'll do it, but brother, Allah will not give you what you're looking for. Or will not give you what you should be getting. He'll give you what you're looking for. If you think this is the greatest gift I have, I have salah. Oh my God, brother, sisters, if you're treating it with, with a sense of awe and appreciation, Allah will give you, inshallah, great thing. You know, I, uh, I have a friend who is a convert. He's been Muslim for three and a half years. There's a group of people who came to him to try to convert him back. And he actually thought of, not thought of converting, but thought of the meaning of him converting back. He says, Tarif, in the midst of the conversation, I realized something. He was Christian, so he never prayed. He says, while they're talking to me, they were like, bewildered, like, you became Muslim? Like, you know, you can't do that, like, you need to get back. He says, you don't understand the feeling that, that overcame me. And I said, what was it? He said, Tarif, I thought, what does it mean for me to leave Islam and go back? Wallahi, the first thing he says, it means I have no salah. You understand what that means? I, it hit me hard. I never saw it that way. He says, don't even understand what salah means for me. I never had that in my life. It's everything for me. I'm going to lose that? Like, he was going to lose his mind thinking about the possibility of me. It means I have to give up salah. I have to give up this beautiful Allah. I never, like, you know what I'm He was crying, talking to me about the idea, the possibility of him giving that up. He says, oh my goodness, that means I'm destroyed. And that by itself just shook me so hard when I was talking to these people. Wallahi, brother says, personally, I grew up as a Muslim, I never saw it that way. I never saw it yet, oh, I'm so blessed to be a Muslim, that I have salah. I have Allah who's so beautiful, who's not a human. All powerful, all knowledgeable, all merciful. That's yours, brothers and sisters. Salah is a gift. If they say, the scholars say, if the kings knew what you get in the salah, and what it is, and, and, and the, the beautiful treasure that it is, they would have fought you for it. You know people fought you over money, power, authority? If you and I knew what Salah is, we'll be scrambling to do it. And if others who never pray and never understand Salah knew what you have, they'll fight you over it. Imagine we have it and we think we don't have anything in life. Oh, complain, I don't have this, and have, why didn't Allah give me this? Look at their education, look at their parents, look at their home, their spouse. You have Salah. And the subject. Best, most beautiful gift. It's what's going to put you in Jannah, the best home, with the best spouse, with the best everything. It's going to put you in touch with Allah, the most powerful, the all nurturing. Your Allah, yours. Better than anything that, that all people amass. And brothers and sisters, well.